Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Father, thank you for the word today. And I believe that for some people, they're going to hear something today that's going to really be a turning point for them. So I thank you for the word. Help me deliver it just exactly the way you want it done and help every person to stay focused and hear exactly what they need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to open your Bibles up to Isaiah 61. First of all, let me say that Jesus can heal you everywhere you hurt. Everywhere. If you're hurting spiritually, mentally, emotionally, financially, in relationships, I want you to grasp hold of this next thing I'm going to say. There's no area in your life that God doesn't care about. Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing in your life that he doesn't care about. And there's nothing in your life that you can't bring to him and ask him to help you with. Now, I think that's a great revelation that probably Christians all over the world need to hear because I spent many years of my life as a believer thinking that, I mean, I don't even know that I consciously thought this, but I didn't have any idea that God was interested in any part of me other than the spiritual part of me to forgive my sins and help me get to heaven. I, first of all, I didn't even know I had a mental problem. I thought everybody else in the world had a problem. I didn't know that it was my thinking. I didn't really know that I had emotional problems. I mean, I knew that I got upset easy and I knew that I was angry a lot. And, you know, I don't even know that I really knew that I was insecure. You know, I was real manipulative and controlling and You know, we, when, when we're all messed up in order to survive it, we find ways to mask it. We put masks on it and we make excuses for it and we can easily convince ourselves that everybody else has got a problem and if they would change, then we'd be okay. Yes, no, maybe. Come on, it's Saturday morning. I'm a little tired, so you got to help me today. Amen. Now. And I really want you to, to know that anything that hurts you, God wants to heal it. Now, when I began to understand scriptures like what I'm getting ready to read you in Isaiah, it was very life-changing for me. So, verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed and qualified me to preach the gospel of good tidings to the meek, the poor, and the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up and heal the brokenhearted. Now, I believe that the world is filled with brokenhearted people. And what really does that mean, just so we can make it practical? I think that to be brokenhearted means to be broken in personality. It means that we're not functioning the way that God wants us to function if we were functioning at our best. I mean, the way that I behave and my relationships with people now, and especially the way that I behave and my relationship with my husband is so amazingly different than the way I behaved 40 some odd years ago when Dave and I first got married. To be honest, when I look back, I think, I don't know how in the world you stood me or put up with me, and yet God did give him a grace Because God saw my heart, and the good thing is, is God not only sees where you're at, he sees where you're going to be if he works with you a little bit. Amen? And just kind of as an aside here, sometimes God will assign you to a brokenhearted person. I know, we all want somebody that's all fixed up and put together and perfect so they can make us happy. But honestly, we pray we want to be used by God. And, you know, Dave, I mean, this is what I'm going to tell you here is the absolute truth. Dave was 26. I was 23 when we met. I'd already been through a bad marriage and a divorce, five years of being married to somebody that mistreated me after already being mistreated for most of my life. I had one child that 
Interestingly enough, I named David, and um, he pulled up out in front of my mom and dad's house to pick up a guy that he worked with, and I was out there washing my car, and I had on short shorts and had one of those big beehives, and <laughs> you know, he's, he, he was, Dave was praying for a wife. He said, I want, told the Lord, I want to get married, I'm ready to get married. And he's a man that definitely believes that faith without works is dead because he was dating three different women at the time. <laughs> so he, he wasn't much on just being passive and sitting around. He, he was after it. And he said he knew that none of those three were right. So when he saw me, he said, hey, if, when you're finished washing that car, you want to wash mine? Well, you know, I didn't trust men and I was a sarcastic you know, a little snot, and I turned around and I said, if you want your car washed, wash it yourself. <laughs> and he said what went off on the inside of him was, that's the girl for me. <laughs> so maybe he is mentally ill after all, I don't know. <laughs> but here's the thing. When he began to pray for a wife, listen to what he said. He said, God, make it somebody that needs help. Now, honestly, I wonder how many people would have the courage to pray that prayer. Is anybody here that wants to get married ever said, God, I want to get married. Make it somebody that's all messed up that I can help. But here's the thing to remember. There are a lot of people out there that need help. And I was somebody, I had, I had been aware of God since I was a little girl, and I so wanted to serve God. I mean, I really wanted to live right and to serve God. I had a good heart, but I had a broken personality. I was broken inside. And I didn't need somebody just to tell me about Jesus, because people had done that. I needed somebody to show me Jesus. Come on, now listen. And maybe God has put you with a broken-hearted person, a person who's a little messy, a little not so easy to get along with, but there, there's a spark there. There's something worth saving. And maybe God just wants you to be there. You know, I think that there's a great ministry called the ministry of being there. Did you hear me? Sometimes we don't need to preach to somebody. That can actually be the worst thing we do. Sometimes we just need to be there, and we need to be a Christian, not a religious Pharisee. There's a difference. Come on, folks. But just be a real Christian consistently, and somebody can say, well, maybe there is a different way to live than the way I'm living. You see, I was so messed up, I didn't even know what peace was. I didn't even know that peace was possible. I lived in an angry household with ranting and raving all the time and just a lot of, you know, sin and wickedness and abuse. And I grew up, everything in my life, I was rooted in fear. And so I had no idea what peace was like. And here, God gives me this man because even when I was married to my first husband, now this is how God hears your prayers. Even when I was married to my first husband, I would lay in bed beside him at night and pray God, please give me somebody someday in my life that will really love me and make it somebody that will take me to church. That was my prayer. Please give me somebody that will really love me because I knew that that guy didn't love me. I really knew when I married him it wasn't going to work out, but I was desperate. And desperate people do really stupid things. And so, for years, and it got a little better each year, but for years, Dave just was consistently a man of God. Now, that doesn't mean that he didn't confront me. That doesn't mean that he, we didn't, you know, ever talk about my behavior, but Dave was happy in front of me. He wasn't going to let me steal his joy. He was peaceful. He was forgiving. He was just a wonderful example. And he actually made me hungry and thirsty for what he had. Doesn't the Bible say that you are the salt of the earth? Let me ask you a question. Are you making anybody thirsty for what you have? Yeah. 
Is anybody looking at you and saying, man, I would love to be like that? I didn't even know a life like that was possible. So anyway, I'm just throwing that out for good measure that, you know, sometimes you have to be willing to suffer through some things that are not very pleasant for you for the salvation and the healing of another individual. <laughs> to be honest, I think we might just go ahead and say that I think sometimes we are overly concerned about what we're getting out of everything and whether or not it's making us comfortable. And you know, maybe we should just stop praying and asking God to use us if we don't really mean it. Oh well, I'll go on. <laughs> he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim or declare liberty to the physical and spiritual captives and the opening of the prison and of the eyes to those who are bound. What a wonderful first scripture here. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of his favor, and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. And you know, the acceptable day of the Lord is always this day. This day is the day that you can begin a healing process in your life. This day is the day that you can be saved. This day is the day that you can be touched by God. This day is the day that you can have a complete turnaround in your life. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. It can be this day. Jesus is not the great I will be. He's the great I am. Amen? And he's here for you today. And even the better news is, is you cannot and never will be able to deserve anything that Jesus has done for you, and neither can I. So we need to learn how to just receive like little children and be very grateful that God loves us. Now, to grant consolation and joy to those who mourn in Zion, verse 3, Isaiah 61, 3. To grant consolation and joy to those who mourn in Zion. Is there anybody here that's done enough mourning to last you a lifetime and you're ready for some joy? <laughs> to give them an ornament, a garland, a diadem of beauty instead of ashes. Hallelujah. Now, beauty for ashes. Now, that means that you can take a burned up trash can life <laughs> and you can bring it to Jesus. He'll take even that and he will give you back something beautiful. Come on. But now let me say something important and this is a real key here. It's nice to read scriptures like this and say, oh yes, I want beauty for ashes. But you have to give up your ashes before you get the beauty. Well, now, what do you mean by that? Well, bitterness, resentment, chip on your shoulder, bad attitude, self-pity, <laughs> being negative, a passive, lazy spirit that sits around and wants everybody else to do something for them all the time, but they won't do anything for themselves. Come on, I had all that going on in my life. Every bit of it. I didn't even know the beauty was available, but even after I found out, I still wasn't ready to give up my ashes. You know, sometimes we just like to, we just kind of enjoy, as dumb as it is, we enjoy sitting around and feeling sorry for ourselves all day. You gotta give that stuff up. That's not gonna do you any good. If you really want to have a beautiful life, the first step is to forgive everybody who hurt you. Completely, totally forgive them. And yes, what they did to you is not right, but you are not hurting them by hating them. Please understand, you are not hurting anybody who hurt you by hating them or being angry at them. You are actually only continuing to hurt yourself and the devil is having a party. Well, it's not fair. No, what people do to us is not fair, but there's a much better plan in God's word 
That is that God said, I will bring justice. And that means that God is the only one who can take wrong things and make them right. And God will do that, but you can't keep your ashes. Now, this is kind of where we're at today. Are you ready to totally forgive? Yes. Completely. Well, I've tried and I've tried and I just feel. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a decision you make about how you're going to treat people and how you're going to talk about them and how you're going to pray for them. I mean, you, you can just cringe inside when you see somebody that hurts you, that has hurt you, and that doesn't mean you can't forgive them and love them. Even love is not a feeling, it's a decision. No, we don't want to pray for our enemies to be blessed, but God says to do it, so there must be something amazing in it for us. I mean, I, I've even told God, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for them to be blessed, but I have to be honest and tell you, I really don't want you to bless them. Well, we don't need to play games with God. He knows everything. You know, I'm kind of afraid if I pray, you might answer my prayer, and I really don't want them to be blessed, but, you know, I'm going to do it in obedience to you, and, you know, I think, I think God's answer might be, you, you, you don't have to worry about none of that. The first thing I'm going to bless them with is some revelation. It's not like if you pray for your enemies, they're going to get a new house and a new car, you know? When we start praying for people, it means that God can open their eyes to see what's really, what they're really doing. You know, here's the thing. Hurting people hurt people. My father was so messed up, and he knew that sexually abusing me was wrong. But I'm telling you the truth. I remember the day that he looked at me like, I mean, I was in my 60s by then, and he was an in his 80s, and he, and he said, he'd never apologized to me. He finally got around to doing it, and he said, I had no idea that what I was doing to you was hurting you that bad. And I don't think people get it. He started seeing things on television about abuse and started getting a little revelation of what it does to people, and he had no idea. He knew it was wrong, and he knew it was selfish, but he had no idea what the long-term effects was going to be in my life. And I think a lot of people who hurt us, they're just acting out of their own pain, and they really don't have any idea what they're doing, and we need to just stop being mad about something all the time and be glad that God can take anything in our lives and work good out of it. Amen? Amen? What a joyful message the gospel of Jesus Christ is. The good news of the gospel. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news, to bring you glad tidings and good news that there's nothing in your life that hurts you that Jesus can't heal. Now, he gives us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a heavy burden and a failing spirit, that you might ultimately be called an oak or a tree of righteousness, lofty, strong, and magnificent, distinguished for uprightness, justice, and right standing of God, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So God wants to take us from being a total wreck of a mess to someone who is healed and whole and helping other people whose life glorifies him with every breath that they take. Now, you talk about getting the devil back, let me tell you, that's payback he doesn't like. And then just verse 7 and 8. Instead of your former shame, you shall have a twofold recompense. Instead of dishonor and reproach, your people shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double what they forfeited. Oh, my. An everlasting joy shall be theirs. You know, I gave up some stuff. I never got to be a child, but I guess that would have been good. But now I have double, according to the Word of God, what I would have had if I would have had a normal life. Don't sit around and be depressed because you never had a normal life. 
Give the thing to God. Give the broken life that you had. Give him your pain. Give him all your disadvantages. Give him everything that you've had a bad attitude about and let him give you back double what you lost. You're gonna end up with a better deal in the long run than if you would have had the first plan to work. I mean, if we really understand this, how can we be in anything other than just so excited about our walk with God? Amen. And you know what? You'll never convince me that what I'm saying is not true. This is not a bunch of hype. This is not just a cheerleading session. It has happened to me. And I've seen it happen to lots of other people. Dave shared his story last night about his dad being an alcoholic and never being there for them and never coming to any kind of a uh, ball game. I mean, his dad just hid in the basement all the time and, and, and drank. They had like, back in, in those days, they had like old cellars and we had coal furnaces and there would be coal bins. And, and uh, then a lot of times after people weren't using those furnaces anymore, they would just be like an empty, dirty room. And that's where his dad hid his wine bottles. And, and that whole room was just full of wine bottles. And yet Dave had a godly mother and, he, and he, he was a godly man. And he served in the armed forces. And he wanted to help somebody. And he prayed for a wife that needed help. And my goodness, here we are now. And we could have just stayed too messed up, miserable, broke. He could have been bitter because he never had a dad. He could have become an alcoholic just like his dad. He could have been full of hatred. I could have been hating people all my life. I could have been a prostitute or done no tellings what. But God. Come on, but God. I wish today that you could just for five minutes have a glance of what I was like on the inside. Oh, I could dress it up and take it to church and put some paint on it and nobody knew. But honey, you didn't want to be in any kind of close relationship with me. Like I said, we can dress it up and take it to work or take it to church or go out in the shopping mall, and, but you, you get close to people, man, that's why a lot of messed up people are petrified of intimacy. They're afraid somebody's going to find out what they're really like. Verse 8, the first sentence, for I, the Lord, love justice. One of my favorite things about the character of God is that he's always just. Life is not fair, but God is just. Amen? Now, I don't believe that God just wants you to be hurt and live hurt. I don't even believe that God wants us to be healed and just live healed. I think he wants us to go on to step three, which is now I'm ready to help other people. So if you really want to make the devil mad and get him back for everything he did for you, you say, I'm not going to live wounded my whole life. I'm going to receive healing. But I'm not even going to stop there. I'm not just going to sit around and enjoy my good feeling of healing. I'm going to spend my life helping other people realize that what God did for me, he can also do it for somebody else. You know, you can put an end to generations of devastation if you'll be the one that will draw the bloodline of Christ across your life and say, this mess that came from my parents to me is not going from me to my kids. Don't pass it on. Now, emotionally unhealthy people have been wounded in their soul and they've never been properly healed. What is the road to healing? Well, I just wrote down a few steps here. Number one, believe God can work out anything that's happened to you for good. That's the first thing you need to believe. No matter what's happened to me, God can work it out for good. And if I were you, I would live with that belief every day of my life. Second, totally forgive. We've talked about that. Number three, renew your mind. If you've been hurt really bad, I can promise you that you don't know how to think right. Sorry, but you just don't. Not trying to be insulting, but you don't. There's no telling how many people that love God, their minds are so messed up and they believe all these lies the devil has told them, like you can never overcome this. You're never gonna be any good. You're used merchandise. I spent so many years of my life with a shame-based nature. I was ashamed of not just what my dad did to me, but I was ashamed of me because he did it. 
And I had a constant record playing in my head that, that just had, it was a one-line song. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Have any of you ever heard that? What is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Why am I not like other people? What's wrong with me? And you know what? I never hear that song playing anymore. Never hear that song anymore. Amen. Have you been hurt in the past? Do you feel wounded in your soul or like you have a broken heart? You know, God wants to exchange that brokenness for wholeness. He wants to give you beauty for ashes. But you must be willing to give up the ashes. We have to stop looking behind and begin to look to the future. God's got wonderful things in store for you. I'm always amazed when we come to a medical clinic that we can come out to a, a field or something that there's absolutely nothing and it becomes a well-oiled machine of, of medical care. How long have we been doing this? Uh, this is our 100th outreach. That's and, awesome. And uh, I want to see it's close to 10 or 11 years. Walk us through how this process works for your team. Patients, they come in and uh, they, they're waiting in line. Um, from there, they'll go in, have weights and temps, and see a, see a nurse for, for triage, where they'll ask their primary chief complaint. Um, what's the one main reason that you're here? How, how can we help you? From there, they're afforded the opportunity to either see a doctor or a dentist completely free of charge. Um, from a doctor, we ask every single patient that comes in, uh, can we pray for you? And then from there, once they exit, they come here and they receive uh, free medicine. Describe for someone watching at home what you see out here on a regular basis. What is it like? Some have the same our patients at home have, but we also have rare diseases we don't see in, uh, in Europe. And uh, I also have the experience that the patients here are very um, humble, they are very thankful, and um, they, they have the hope that you bring them some help. Uh, there was a man who was coming because he said he cannot see properly. So um, we tried glasses, and I really uh, loved this moment when he put on the glasses, and I could see that he gets really happy, and then he just said, I can read. And I was like, just didn't want to freak out totally, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to stay professional, yes. and yet you're yes. so excited for yes. what's happening. That's awesome. Yeah. Are people impacted for Christ through what you're doing here? Yes, I think so, because um, I do that because I love Jesus. I think they feel it, and yeah, sometimes we just pray right at the investigation table <laughs> just to make them know that Jesus is the doctor all above us. Yeah. Here at the medical clinic, we are seeing many people getting help that they've needed for a long time, and our wonderful volunteers here, they work so hard, and we're just so grateful for all of you that make this possible. So right now, let me just ask you, to be a part of everything that we're doing. Your special gift today can help lives in ways that you can never imagine. But together, we can make a big, big difference. So call us right now, go to the website, joycemeyer.org, and give a special gift today that will help people, not only here in Africa, but all over the world. Zelfbewust te zijn heeft alles te maken met vertrouwen op God. Dit is precies waar het over gaat in het dagboek van Joyce. Je bent wonderlijk gemaakt. Vertrouw op God en weet dat je waardevol bent voor Hem. Hij geeft je de kracht om nieuwe dingen te doen en hiervoor je gaven in te zetten. God heeft je wonderlijk gemaakt om moedig en vrij jezelf te zijn. Met dit dagboek voor vrouwen ontdek je elke dag iets meer hoe kostbaar je bent voor God. Bestel je bent wonderlijk gemaakt door te bellen met 026 20 22 100 of online via joyce-meyer.nl.
slash wonderluk.